Morning everyone. Sometimes my family and friends reprimand me by saying you are too soft, you need to toughen up and learn to say no. I often respond to them by saying you want me to change and be something that I'm not. I'm quite a generous person in every aspect of my life, but of course I do take on board what they say to me. And then I recall my ministry and what may have happened if I had taken the stance and said no. The choices we make in life can have eternal consequences, either for the good or not so good. In our visit to Pakistan this week, we meet up with Major Fozia, who throughout her life has said yes to God, and the effects of that decision have impacted her family, her ministry and the Salvation Army. Today is our altar service, when once again we are given the opportunity to say yes to supporting the work of the Salvation Army all over the world. We have heard of the many challenges they are facing and it's our privilege to be part of the answer in meeting those needs. You may like to place the Bible open before you as each of us share in the altar service. May the Lord bless us during this meeting. Welcome to worship. Hello and welcome to the last of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. This week I'll be making a call to Pakistan, which is one of our partners in mission, along with Denmark and Greenland, Finland and Estonia, Ghana including Togo and South America East. We featured Pakistan in the 2016 Self-Denial Appeal, when Kerry Koch visited the country. Pakistan has very much been the main focus for me and Rebecca for the last two years, and even though our plans have changed, we still feel very connected. Today I'll be talking to Fozia Columbus. When Kerry was making an episode about education, she met Fozia as she took her girls to school. The family would have been our next door neighbours had things worked out differently for us, so I'm really pleased to be able to connect with her today. The girls have grown and Fozia is now the core based community development manager at Territorial Headquarters in Lahore, and she looks after some of the projects funded by Self Denial. Salam, Major Kozia. Oh, salam, Captain Ben. <laughs> uh, nice to see you. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Ah, tiko, tik tak, alhamdulillah. Yeah, and um, how are your how are your children? They are doing good, and at the moment they are at home uh, because of the co- because of the COVID. That school are closed, and uh, almost the one year they are at home. We'd be so interested to know how has it been for the Salvation Army and its mission in 2020 with all that's the all that's gone. Could you tell us a bit about that? When the country was locked down, that was not easy time for, especially for the poor, those who are uh, uh, facing difficulty to get food. But I'm glad that the Salvation Army did uh, tremendous work within the communities. We are serving communities without discrimination. We provide food, grocery to the poor, and uh, uh, health and safety kits to, to the poor. Uh, and that really uh, uh, good effort and get that really good initiative by the Salvation Army Pakistan. Mm. And and how about the the cause in Pakistan? How, how many cause do you have roughly? And and have they been able to meet throughout twenty twenty? We do have one hundred and thirty two uh, cause in Pakistan, and more than three hundred active officers we have in Pakistan. We have forty three cadets. Uh, at the moment in our training college. We are not allowed to open the church, but our officers and uh, uh, our local officers, uh, they connect uh, the communities with phone or with, via the social media. But our officers, they did uh, really good work uh, on, uh, on the COVID. And uh, we face COVID and the flood at the same time. 
but uh, the churches and the NGOs and the Salvation Army, they come out uh, from their uh, offices, from their homes, and they serve the communities. Uh, for the personnel, our offices, they enhance their capacity building. And from the last three years, our five offices serve in uh, a different course in UK, and one officer, she is working in the IHQ. And this is, uh, I, I believe that for the Pakistan territory, this is good. Um, encouraging for us. Well, I think for us, I think it's I think it's been such a great example of the mutuality of support. It's not just support flowing one way. We've needed the reinforcements from the Pakistan territory to to show us their yeah. experience, to to lead in the ways that they know are successful, and uh, just to bless our territory. Yeah. Fozia, tell us about your hopes and dreams for your family your ministry and, and for the wider Salvation Army? Uh, my hope and dreams for my girls should be the good Christians, independent women, courageous women. This is my dream. My dream for my ministry, when I give myself to God and I say yes to him. And I believe that since from that day to till now and till my death, he is always with me. And he will take me and he will guide me and he will show me the way where he will be taking me. And I always say yes to him. And the dream for the Salvation Army, uh, for the Pakistan, through our love, our support and our uh, call, uh, we will uh, make good disciples for the Jesus Christ. Thank you for inspiring our territory and being partners with us. And... Um... Yeah, thank you for saying yes all those years ago yes. and keeping saying yes. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time and your inspiration. So God bless you. God bless you too. Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, that brings us to the end of our self-denial films. I wanted to find out how the Salvish Army has adapted to the pandemic. And while I've gained just a snapshot of what's happening around the world, I've been really inspired by the people I've talked to. I've heard how Salvationists and friends have been coping with a host of different crises, typhoons, cyclones, flooding, and economic hardship, along with all the difficulties that this pandemic has brought. And I've heard about the incredible resilience of communities where the Salvation Army is at work. I loved what Nana Togo said about showing love when you can't be physically together. There are plenty of challenges ahead. Poverty is widespread and the Salvation Army has limited resources. But I feel more convinced of the vital work that needs to be done. Work that is possible because of the money that is given through self-denial. Richard Bradbury reminded us that this is the Salvation Army's international self-denial appeal. We are all involved. And while each of us here reflect prayerfully on what we can give, Salvationists around the world are doing the same.
Here is a very poetic devotional hymn by Leslie Taylor Hunt. When his father, Regimental Sergeant Major Gilbert Hunt, died in Leslie's youth, he was adopted by an aunt and uncle, the Taylors, in Western Supermare, England. The uncle was bandmaster at the local corps, and that is where Leslie was introduced to the Salvation Army. He must have quickly become a very keen and active Salvationist, as during World War I he was sent in charge of Hastings Three Corps, even though he was only 16 years old. After the war, Leslie entered the training garrison and then worked in Czechoslovakia for a time. He was a cadet sergeant. Leslie was appointed to International Headquarters, London, in the Overseas, Literary and Secretarial Departments. During this period, he often accompanied General Bramwell Booth on campaigns in Britain and other parts of Europe, and as a vocal soloist in meetings led by the General. O oh Lord, by the power in your Holy Spirit, enable me to live a holy life so I can represent Christ on earth in Jesus' name. Help me walk with you in holiness so that I will fulfil my destiny and the purpose of my existence. Lord of righteousness in this world that is full of violence, selfishness, murder and other evil deeds, Teach me the path of holiness and engrave me to live like Christ in words, thoughts and deeds. Teach me your word and make it easy to apply it to my life so that I will see goodness in all the days of my life. 
Give me the spirit of humility so that I will be able to walk with you in holiness, Jesus' name. Lord, and grace me to keep your commandments. Take iniquity far away from me. In, in Jesus', Jesus name, name I, I pray. pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to Open Gates SA Quarantine News. I'm your anchor, Troy Dusseloy. Today's top stories. Man who robbed a bakery today said in a statement that he knew it was wrong, but it was a whisk he had to take. And we find out which word in the English language is most often spelt incorrectly. Now, we can go live to our reporter in the field. Hi folks, and today do we have a tale for you. We spoke to one of God's messengers called Jonah, and he told us about his life trying to run away from God, and then eventually doing what he was asked to do. It all started one day when Jonah heard God's voice telling him to go to a place called Nineveh to tell them to stop doing bad stuff. But Jonah doesn't fancy it. He decided to try and run away, fleeing to a place famous for its bakeries called Jaffa. He then decides to catch a boat and try and sail further away from God. This was not effective. The boat is caught in a storm and Jonah tells the shipmates that it is his fault for turning away from God. So naturally, they chuck him overboard. That could have been the end of the road, or I guess the sea, for Jonah. But miraculously, God sent a big fish to swallow him. Instead of becoming chow, Jonah was able to stay in the big fish for three whole days. Eventually, when this fish spit him up on land, he was not entirely surprised to find that his crews had landed him right where God had wanted him all along, Nineveh. Now, God told Jonah to tell these people to make themselves better in the next 40 days, otherwise God wouldn't be happy with them and would turn the city to dust. At first, Jonah found it hard to get the message across, presumably because of the smell of living in a fish for three days. But eventually the city repented and God decided that they were being honest and sincere in their promise to be better and so looked after the city instead of turning it to dust. And that is some of the story of Jonah. Back to you in the studio. Well, that's all for now, folks. See you next time. Good night.
Good morning. Our Bible reading this morning takes the form of two parts. Firstly, I'm reading from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then moving on to chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. The first part, Jonah flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he proclaimed to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, <clears throat> herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. But what shall we do? Content ourselves by singing a hymn, offering a prayer, or giving a little good advice? No, 10,000 times no. We will pity them, teach them, reclaim them, employ them. Perhaps we still fail with many, quite likely, but our business is to help them all the same. So let us hate to the rescue. Who in this company will lend a hand? Father of this army, captain of our soldiers, may your glory fill the earth. As this world grows colder, may your troops be bolder, may we fight with all
Today I would like us to consider Jonah, recorded for us in the Old Testament. The son of Amittai, who came from Gathepha, a small border town in the ancient Israel known to us as Galilee. Jonah was a well-known prophet during the reign of the Israelite king Jeroboam. And Jonah prophesied the king's success in restoring Israel's borders. But now Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, a large, prominent, pagan, Gentile city in its day. This, the Assyrians were Israel's long-time enemy, and God was asking Jonah to prophesy against them because of their wickedness. When the call of God came to him, Jonah could not see beyond his own selfish desires for God to punish the Assyrians. How could God want him to take the message of mercy to such a people? So Jonah, whose name means dove, decided to fly away in a different direction. In his disobedience, he actually said no to God's will for his life. Do you ever find yourself fighting against God? Your desires pulling you one way, God's desires pulling you another. Jonah found himself in this very position, but his own desire won out over God for a time. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Was it because the task was too hard for him, or was he content in prophesying good news, and this message was one of condemnation? Or was it because Jonah didn't want the Assyrians in Nineveh to escape God's judgment? For whatever reason, Jonah said no. Tarshish was thought to be towards the end of the earth. Jonah wanted to go as far away as he could to escape God's presence. Nineveh was to the east of Israel and Tarshish was about as far as you could go west. So Jonah was soon to find out that you cannot escape the presence of God. Psalm 139 reminds us, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If God had not intervened in the life of Jonah, what may have happened? 
Jonah would not have been happy for his disobedience and Nineveh would have felt the wrath of God upon them. So God sends a storm, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship. He had lain down and was fast asleep. When the storm raged, Jonah slept. Perhaps because the storm outside seemed insignificant to him in comparison to the storm inside. The storm that came from his resistance against God. The mariners were afraid because they knew that Jonah was the problem because of his disobedience. And Jonah, at his own request, asked to be thrown into the sea. And the sailors reluctantly agree. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What happens when God wants a person to do something, but the person does not want to do it? Jonah shows us that God has a way of bringing us to the place where he wants us to be. In Jonah's case, it was a storm and a fish. And Jonah realised by saying no to God, he had brought his own consequences upon himself. I have been cast into the deeps. I have been cast out of your sight. He could not bear the idea of being separated from God and his presence in his life. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord out of the belly of the fish and said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me, out of the belly of Shaul I cried and you heard my voice. Jonah repented from running away from God and he turned to God with sacrifice and thanksgiving. He promised to pay his vows to God and do whatever God told him to do. Jonah never forgot what God had asked of him. And Jonah realised that he must put a stop to resisting God. However, God calls Jonah a second time. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Jonah now obeys the call and goes to Nineveh. He says yes to God's will. The reluctant prophet becomes the repentant prophet, who then becomes the responding prophet, and through his message becomes the releasing prophet releasing the people of Nineveh from the wrath and the judgment of God. Cry mightily to God, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. The Assyrians said yes to God. They repented of their wrongdoing. They were filled with hope as God's mercy and love was displayed upon them. Saying yes to God is not always easy to do, but it is rewarding when you follow his will. Stuart Townsend states in his song, There is Hope, My highest calling and my deepest joy is to make his will my home. As we listen to this song, we will have the opportunity to place our gifts on the Bibles before us. Our ability to say yes will impact all the people all over the world who today need to experience God's salvation, God's love and God's mercy in their difficult situations. Therefore, let us listen and pray and respond to our self-denial appeal.
2021. May God bless us all. Generous and loving God, we come to you in thanksgiving, knowing that all we are and all we have is a gift from you. In faith and love, help us to do your will. 
We are listening. Speak your words in the depths of our souls, that we may hear you clearly. We offer to you this day all the facets of our lives, whether it be at home, at work or at school. We seek to be patient, to be merciful, to be generous, to be holy. Give us a wisdom and insight to understand your will for us and the fervour to carry out our good intentions. We offer our gifts of time, talent and possessions to you as a true act of faith to reflect our love for you and our neighbours. Help us to reach out to others as you have reached out to us. Amen. The benediction, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift.